Hi, this is Keith Champagne. I am the writer of The Switch, Electricia, and many, 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 many other comic books that you probably have read, I'm guessing, uh, and you are watching and listening to Two Geeks Talking. Hi, I'm Tom Nugent. I am a comic book artist for Marvel and DC, and I'm also the co-creator of The Switch, Electricia with Keith Champagne, and you are listening to Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, and evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined today by not one, but two creative and talented individuals from the comic scene. You know there were a lot of DC comics and many other things, but we're talking about an independent comic that's come back and remastered. And we are joined by the ever-talented Keith Champagne and Tom Nguyen from The Switch. How are you guys doing today? <laughs> Good. How are you? Thanks for having us. Nice to have you both on. For those that don't know anything about yourselves as creative people, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talking. I've been wondering that myself a long time. My name is Tom Nguyen. I'm a comic book artist. I am lucky enough to uh, draw to pay the bills. I've uh, had over well over two decades of professional experience. So I broke in in late 1996. I think Keith has been in the business a little longer than I have. Broke in as an inker, uh, worked on a bunch of books. Like uh, my first book was called Major Bummer. And then from there, I moved on to Superman, the Man of Steel and then JLA, and then uh, Justice League Elite, and then Batman. That Batman run is particularly good to me because that was the run that um, I was part of the creative team of Under the Red Hood. So that's Jason Todd's first appearance as the Red Hood. And then from there, did a little bit of Final Crisis, jumped around back and forth on a bunch of Green Lantern stuff, mainly uh, Blackest Night Saga, Catwoman, Barbed Wire, odds and ends, wherever they need me, basically. But over the last few years, I've been full-time in the, the television industry, just doing artwork for TV shows. So a little bit of a career pivot, but I still have a foot in comics. Just came out with some exclusive variant covers, you know, over the last few months for Dynamite and DC. I'm still in it, just not full-time like I used to be, but still love the medium. Right now, Keith and I are trying to push to get this remastered edition of uh, the Switch out, and then from there we're going to work on a, a proper full-on sequel that's me in a nutshell uh, I broke into the comic book industry in 1993, I believe it was, and spent well over two decades working full-time for DC Comics. I was under contract for a long time. Now I kind of tomcat around the industry. I just do what seems fun and what comes my way. I've been a writer, an inker, a penciler, a letterer, an editor. I did a little bit of coloring way back in the day, so I like to think I've done everything in comics. Like Tom said, the Switch is our creator-owned book. It's our, our real love letter. It's everything that we love about comic books crammed into one book. It first came out about six years ago. We're in the process of reintroducing the character to the marketplace and setting up a brand new adventure. And so our first step to do that is to you know, put out a new edition of the original book like remastered with new art, story, lettering, coloring, pinup section, you know, a lot of extras in the back. Give, you know, give people a reason to buy it twice. And, and, uh, and that's me in a nutshell, too. Wonderful. So what is the Switch all about from the Kickstarter as well as the artwork from other past interviews, like on Keeping It Geekly, which was a looked like an amazing uh, time you, you all had there? Because I love the concept from what I heard about it. So the switch is the story of uh, Jennifer Bellino, who is known to the world at large as Electricia, uh, named after, after my mom, Patricia. Electricia is a supervillain. She's, you know, very firmly uh, ensconced on the FBI top 10 list for, for 20 years or so. But she's just come to really hate herself, you know, and as she's getting older, she's realizing that she has fallen way short of the person that her father wanted her to be at one point. She has this dissatisfaction with who she is. One night, she accidentally, not accidentally, but like through happenstance, does something to help somebody else out for the first time. And it makes her feel good for the first time in a long, long time. And that leads to her creating a second identity as a, as a hero, the switch, uh, and starting to fight crime instead of committing crime. So there's a group of superheroes in this book who are hot on Electricia's trail and then her villain friends are now you know hunting down the switch so she's kind of taking it from both ends metaphorically kind of culminates in a giant resolution so yeah it's basically a story of change of transformation of wanting to be a better person from top to bottom yeah what's the most misunderstood aspect about the superhero genre that people who don't follow it misunderstand when you look beyond the capes and the superpowers and, you know, the bright colored stuff and the kapow sound effects or whatever. I think that superhero comics, metaphorically, a great way to tell stories about everything. 
much in the same way that science fiction is a lot of allegorical or metaphorical stuff crammed in there. I think that with superheroes, you can really tell a story about any theme. Like in the case of the switch, it's about wanting to change. Is it too late to become a better person? And then you dress that in capes and superpowers and it becomes more easily digestible, I think, to people. That's what I think is maybe not misunderstood, but not understood about superhero comics is that they're a great vehicle to tell deeper, more resonant stories that people might connect to on an emotional level. I'll just echo what Keith said in a nutshell. He basically got it. I think to the average layperson, comic books are still kind of like a kid's book, not taken seriously, but they're a serious medium these days to tell much deeper stories and more adult stories too, not just for kids. It's a great vehicle for as a teaching tool now in schools. So now you have a lot of writing classes incorporating comics, history classes incorporating comics. In fact, I'm working on a comic book right now that has to do with black history, which would double as an excellent teaching tool. You know, when we were kids, I mean, that was kind of frowned upon. You know, I had to hide the fact that I was in the comic books. Nowadays, it's like the, the coolest thing and a lot of movies and entertainment, I mean, they use comic books as a source to make their movies and it's so ingrained in pop culture now. Like you said, if you look deeper, you'll find that, you know, you can have actual meaningful stories, stories that you know, people can relate to, stories that deal with a lot of issues in society or, you know, even mental health or, any, or anything like that. So I think we're finally starting to get out of that stereotype due to the popularity of comic books. Can you tell me a time when DC or Marvel stifled your creativity and how you overcame it? <laughs> you go first, Steve. Every time? <laughs> I mean, when, when it's not, I don't think it's a deliberate, I don't think it's deliberate on the part of DC to stifle people's creativity, but they often have an agenda or they often have restrictions on how their characters can be used or how far you can push the boundaries of what these characters do. I mean, I've had situations where I wasn't allowed to have Superman punch people. I wasn't allowed to have the Joker kill anybody on, on books that I've written. Sometimes when you're well, sorry, I'm a little scattered on this answer. Some of the projects I wrote for DC, stuff like World War Three or Countdown Arena, that was so editorially mandated. Every editor had a, his finger in the pie on those books. And it almost becomes a dance. Like, oh, how do you incorporate all of these notes and all of these people's different ideas and still tell the story that I want to tell? You know, it's a balancing act. And I think with DC in general, like it's almost like they don't mean to restrict what you're doing, but everyone has an opinion. And because they own the characters, you're forced to sort of go along with that. And that can be pretty frustrating. And that's a big reason why I've really fallen in love with the indie comic scene and Kickstarter as a vehicle to fund them, because no one can tell us what to do. No one can tell me I can't have a character say the F word or I can't have a character not punch somebody because we control it now. And it's very, very, very nice. Um, I was going to touch upon what Keith said. I mean, that's probably the biggest reason why doing creator owned stuff is so fulfilling. It's because we can literally do whatever we want, write whatever we want and draw whatever we want without any editorial interference. As far as a personal story, as an artist, there have been times where editorial will ask to make minor changes and stuff. And most of the time, they're correct. I don't mind doing it. Maybe when I was a lot younger, I used to be more into the um, purest artist integrity type attitude, where it's like, don't tell me what to do. You know, this is how I draw. And, you know, you're, you're you know, ruining my ability to express how <laughs> things are shown. But as you get older and you experience more life, you realize that in the grand scheme of things, who cares? No, it's not that big of a deal. You know, it's work. You know, you're just doing it for a check to pay the bills. Not that I'm throwing all artistic integrity out of the way. There's one particular time that's kind of humorous to me that I tell every now and then where an editor actually asked me to ink like someone else, like literally not ink in the way that I normally ink. That What I was hired for, like the first question you would ask is, well, why are you even hiring me if? You don't want me to uh, ink the way I do. Knowing this editor, I totally ignored the advice. I just inked the way I did. And I decided to do reverse psychology mind games with this editor. <laughs> and my next batch that I sent in, not changing a single thing, I asked him directly, how does this look? Does this look closer to you know, what you had in mind? And he responded back, much better. Thank you. And yeah, I didn't change a thing. I think I'll, sometimes... And this is one of the things that us creatives have to deal with from time to time. You know, on top of the stress of perhaps dealing with editorial control, you have to deal with, you know, egos too. And sometimes I feel that some editors will just tell you to do things just for the sake of telling you to do it. You know, it's, it's as if they're looking for a reason to, to justify their position as a, as a editor. Yeah, that's my story. Nice. <laughs> 
What was an early experience where you learned that language had power? Oh, Keith, you go first. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I remember when I was five or six years old, I didn't know what the word fuck meant. And I went to my mom and I said, mom, what's fuck? And she slapped me. And that was a very early experience of mine, learning that language has power in, in sort of a crude childlike way. That definitely made an impression. I find a lot of times now these days, we're in a very sensitive time where you have to be very careful what words you use, especially on social media. I see my kids like really struggling sometimes with expressing themselves because they get in trouble for things that I would never think twice about in school. Yeah, it seems like language has more power than ever these days, but in a different context of what you're allowed or not allowed to say, I guess. I don't know if that's a real answer for what you're looking for. I definitely know I can hurt your feelings with some words if I want to. I have low self-esteem as it is, so. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, I had a very similar experience when I was a child. Uh, I just remember in first grade, everyone was outside for a phys ed class. And then I snuck inside the classroom all by myself. And then I was trying to get my classmates' attention from like the window from inside the classroom. Almost like a, hey, hey guys, I'm inside and you're outside. I went to the chalkboard and I started writing swear words on there. Like the F word and, um, you know, the, the SH word and, and just anything I could think of at the time. Now, how I learned those words at such at six years old, that's a different story altogether. But the point is, I uh, be outrageous or something. It, it got me the attention, probably not the attention that I wanted. I mean, it got me attention, which was like a lot of laughter and snicker from my classmates. I don't even know if they knew what I was doing, but they told on me. I got in deep, deep trouble for it. So that's when I started realizing that maybe... Certain words are out of bounds, at least for kids at that time. You know, everyone usually asks, what's the wisest piece of advice or what's the most bullshit piece of advice you've ever received? But what is the second wisest piece of advice you received that has stuck with you in your careers? I'm not not sure if I was given any advice. If someone gave me some advice, I think I'd have a much different career these days. Probably the best advice I was ever given as an inker through Tex Blaisdell, one of my instructors at the Cubit School. Well, he had two simple mantras. So you can decide which one's the best one and which one's the second best. Uh, His first inking mantra was, when in doubt, black it out. If you're not sure what something is, just silhouette it and move on because you have a deadline to meet. You can't labor too much over this stuff. And his second inking quote, was inking is thinking. That always stuck in my head because that's very true. Like when I first think a page, I take a couple minutes to look over the page and and solve all the problems that the page presents mentally before I even touch it with a brush. Those are two that have always stuck with me from the early days. As a writer, well, the first best piece of advice I got was don't be a writer. And then the second best piece of advice I think I got was uh, show, don't tell, Mm -hmm. which is basic writing. You know, like don't over explain stuff. Like, let the characters explain through their actions. The best piece of advice that I ignored was uh, to go to medical school. No, (laughs) No, the one thing that I've heard, it's actually a saying that's been around. I don't even know what the origin of this saying is, but it's always stuck with me was to work in this business, and it can apply to other businesses too. You have to be two out of three things. You have to be good, fast, or nice as a person. Pick two out of those three things, and generally you'll you'll be employed. You know, that's always stuck with me. As far as what two out of the three I choose, you know, it depends on the the time of day and what uh, phase of my life. I always pick two of those and you'll be fairly safe. The other one is not so much comic advice, but it's more like a life advice. I don't know where I heard this, but I totally agree with it is you choose what you want the day to be for you as far as do you want to have a good day or do you want to have a bad day today? I mean, you can have all the obstacles thrown in your way, things that you can't control, but you can control how you react to them. Just more like training my mind to, to make the best out of what's thrown at you. Well, all the time, I'm going to choose to have the best day that I can. No matter what troubles I have, you know, in personal life and stuff like that. That's really actually just kind of helped me through, uh, you know, the, the tougher times in my career. As far as just practical drawing advice, I've always personally given the advice of if you want to draw comic books, you know, drawing people is probably the easiest thing you can do. But the hardest thing is drawing everything else besides people. You know, drawing uh, everyday things like cars and buildings, maybe some uh, environmental stuff, backgrounds, uh, learning perspective and learning lighting. That's the hard part because everyone, when they start drawing, you know, it's the, the first things they draw are like superheroes, like people try to draw things that you're not comfortable doing. But even within the realm of people, there's, you know, not easy aspects like uh, drawing children, drawing babies, drawing the elderly, drawing different body types, you know, 
most people they get started they just draw the big muscular heroes and the you know the pretty girls you know there's an infinite amount of a variety in humans practice on what people have a hard time drawing and uh, it'll just round your skill set out to the point where you'll be more employable uh, as a comic book artist everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today who was that for you on a personal level my uncle dave was my cool uncle I mean, I have a lot of cool uncles, but he was the one that I was closest to when I was little. And I remember having a conversation with him when I was four, maybe five, very young, about comic books and how com- he was telling me how comic books are so cool and like how we love Luke Cage, especially like, and this would be like about 75, 76. Sometime in that conversation, it clicked in my mind, like, I'm going to be a comic book artist. Like, this is what I want to do. I've already been reading comics for a couple of years, as much as I could read at that point. So that was a very influential uh, moment in my life. It kind of steered the ship for me. And then professionally, there's no bigger influence on what I want to do than uh, John Byrne. John Byrne is my hero as a writer, as an, an artist. I mean, his work always inspired me as a kid. It was what I wanted to like grow up to achieve. You can't really pinpoint like a singular person that I could 100% say, oh, they, they really inspired me to get me to where I am. I had a lot of influences growing up. My first hero was probably Bruce Lee, you know, just watching his movies. The things that really motivated me early on was, first of all, my my dad for discouraging me to uh, getting into comics. Because like when you discourage me and tell me like I can't do something when I know that I can, like that lights a fire under me. You know, as much as my dad wanted me to do the traditional Asian upbringing route of going into a proper medical school or becoming like an engineer or something proper that will bring respectability to the family name, I totally went the other direction. And then it was my art teacher, Pat Wolf, and she was the one that as I was growing up, she was always encouraging me to just stick with it. And she would make concessions for me just so I can draw more. I mean, she saw early on how much I loved it, that I had a talent for it and would even talk to my teachers into letting me get out of class after I finished my homework just so I can draw. And then it was through her that I was able to meet current superstar artist, Doug Mankey, who's still a very dear close friend of mine. In fact, I broke in the industry with Doug's help. We were the art team on a bunch of the books I mentioned earlier. You know, he's the one, the first pro that I've ever met. And he was the one that really tore my work apart. Constructive criticism sense really taught me how to draw comics at the age of starting at the age of 15 and up. So I was really lucky early on. Of all the comic artists in the industry that I could have met, he was the one that I met and became friends with and made the, the biggest impression on me. It's not a bad guy to know, to learn from, you know, when there are lesser artists, quite frankly, in the industry that I have. Um, could have had the fortune or misfortune of, of meeting and learning from. Yeah, my dad, my art teacher, and, and Doug Mankey are probably uh, my biggest uh, influences in, in my life, in my professional career. From a professional standpoint, you are both very successful in regards to, your course, your careers in the comic industry itself, as well as other industries that you're in that we haven't had time to talk about. Do you consider yourself personally successful? No, I don't think I've ever, you know, I, I relate this to a quote I heard Alan Baldwin say one time years ago, and that he considered his film career to be, he considered himself a failure as an actor because his film career, he never really became a leading man. Like he had a, a short stint as a leading man, didn't quite work out, became a supporting actor, a character actor, and he's a great actor. And I look at my career much the same way. Like I'm still trying to get somewhere. I haven't gotten there yet. I'm still trying to create something that is inside of me that I haven't been able to get out yet. I'm still trying to grow. I'm still trying to reach a certain point in my life and career. I'm getting there, but I'm not there yet. Keith put it very well. I will say that probably the most successful I have been, but not really quite saying that it's successful for me. Like everyone has different goals and definitions of what success is. I haven't ever been more successful, but I still feel like there's more to achieve. I don't know how Keith feels, but I still feel like I'm not in my prime yet. And I think that's a good feeling to have because as long as you have that feeling, you have aspiration, you have motivation. And once you lose that, like, let's say, what if I do achieve success? What I picture success as, do I stop creating? Am I lacking motivation at that point? Because I've already achieved in my mind what I sought to achieve. I don't really ever want to be that secure. I always want to have a fire lit under me. Like there's always something I can do. Whatever work I just complete, immediately I look at it and I'm like, I could do better. I'm always picking it apart. So I always feel that my next work is going to be my best work. And I kind of always want that feeling. It's not a bad position to be in. 
my position where I'm proud of what I've achieved, but I still feel there's so much more to prove. With the upcoming uh, Switch sequel that we'll be starting this year, I can't wait to start on that. As proud as I am of the original Switch, I mean, there's so many ways that I'm thinking of redrawing these characters, not totally redesigning them or anything, but tweaks to how I would draw and how I would approach, you know, telling these stories. That is a testament that artists can always still keep growing. I certainly don't want to stop and be comfortable. They say once you get comfortable, then you stop growing. And that's not where success is in my mind. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? Kind of adopt this mentality. It's like, well, I can have a bad day, I can fail, but it's how do I react to it? What can I do? learn from it. First of all, if the failure has come, I can't do anything about it. It's happened. It's how I dig myself out of that hole. Now, failure, just like success, is a different meaning to different people. Personally, to me, failure is not being able to have steady work or not have anyone care about my work. No one is hiring me or no one's purchasing my work or commissioning me. Then I can't make money. I can't pay the bills. I can't provide for family and stuff like that. Like to me, that's the ultimate failure personally. It can be humiliating too. That really just keeps me motivated. Keep consistent on my social media. Keep putting stuff out every day or every other day on my social media. No one's going to hire you if they don't know who you are. So that's why I always tell up and comers, like you are your own best manager. And that's how I deal with failures. I just reassess. Why did I fail? Did I fail because... I didn't draw well enough. Did I fail because of a communication error? Did I rub someone the wrong way? I just kind of go into analytical mode and just kind of dissect and pick apart what I could do better for next time. You can only move forward and apply what you learn to the next steps to get out of failure. Failure <clears throat> sucks if you fall short of something that you're striving to do, but failure, it's just an excuse to try harder. That's the, the bottom line. That's how you deal with it. You just regroup and you do it better the next time. That's all I got to say about that. The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's through the Switch or whether it's through your work with DC and everything else that you've created in between. They may have received some inspiration from you both. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? That's really up to them. But I think if you put your heart and your passion into your work, someone will read it and they'll respond to it in a way that will inspire them. I mean, it's hard to say. I, I'm not sure if anything I've ever done has inspired anybody, but maybe. Uh, it certainly isn't something I try to do when I create work is to inspire someone else to do it. I'm just trying to inspire myself and do my own best work. But yeah, I, I feel like if you put yourself into the work, maybe somewhere down the line, someone will discover it and it will be the impetus for them to try to create something great too. I'm kind of uh, similar in thinking that I don't put too much thought into what future younger generations might carry from my work, but it does give me solace knowing that if I put my best into my own work, eventually and hopefully it'll inspire someone. And then they take away from my work or my life, how I approach my work, how I approach my life and put it into theirs. At the moment, the ultimate compliment to me when I do appearances and shows is uh, I'll have aspiring artists come up to me and tell me they learned something from me or they heard me say something or they picked up one of my books and they tried to emulate this and that. To me, that's one of the biggest compliments I can get as an artist. That impression, <clears throat> they can pass that down to future generations as well. If your life was a comic book or a TV series, what would its title be and what would its soundtrack be? Oh, that's a good one. Have you ever thought about this question? No. I probably have, I don't know, probably Brad Pitt or Leonardo DiCaprio playing me because we look alike, you know? <laughs> <laughs> it's the muscular stature uh, for sure, yeah. <laughs> Jeez, I don't know. I mean, am I, am I trying to go for a likeness here? Should I stay uh, ethnicity accurate or not? Or should we just break the mold and just, just go for Will Smith? Well, I, I mean, if Scarlett Johansson can play the lead character in Ghost in the Shell, I think anything can happen. There you go. I've never even thought about who could play me. Sorry. Quite frankly, I don't care who plays me as long as they, they do the role well. What would my life story be called? I remember thinking, if I ever did an autobiography, like what title would I come up with? And I couldn't even come up with a name then, but whatever name I came up for my autobiography would probably be appropriate for a movie as well. As far as a soundtrack, you know what? You really got me here. I mean, this is something I really have to think about. I'm a soundtrack. I don't know. Various songs from uh, when I grew up through my life, the 80s and 90s. You know, the 90s were really my formative teen years, and I was really into hard rock and heavy metal. If there was a movie made in my life, I can just imagine as I'm growing up, 
the soundtrack would appropriately change with it as I got older and, and my tastes changed. Yeah, you really stumped me, man. I, I don't know what to say to the the title and, and, and actor, Kurt. That's a good one. I'll have to think. I'm sorry I can't give a better answer than that. But at least the soundtrack, I gave you something. I'm sorry, Kurt. Let me just add this. My working title, tentative title, would be The Failed Doctor. <laughs> Can you? I guess mine would be. Can you? Can you mute me? Would be the name of my. <laughs> I think that if my life was a TV show, it probably would be a reality show. Like cameras could follow me around, and I would call it "Waking Up Happy," and it'd be about me trying to stay happy all day long as like different obstacles keep getting thrown in my path. For the soundtrack, I always like that Sanford and Son theme song, so I'd like that to be my intro music. I think, and then maybe like a nice blend of like of funk music throughout the show would be great. Maybe a laugh track. <laughs> well, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I want to thank you, Keith and Tom, for coming on the show. Thank hey, you. thanks for having us. Before, check out the Switch campaign. I was just going to say, before I let you go, where can we find you and how can we support you both online and on social media? I'm on Instagram as the pretentious Keith Champagne. And from that page, you can kind of link to the New Pain Productions Instagram page to our Kickstarter right now for the Switch. Yeah, but Instagram is probably the best starting point. I'm on the Facebook also. I'm pretty easy on social media. If you just Google my name, then like I'm like the first 20 things that pop up. Uh, I'm most active on Instagram and Facebook. A little bit of Twitter, although Twitter doesn't do much for me these days, but I'm still on there but mostly Instagram and Facebook. Well, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. That's the word two, not the number two. On our YouTube channel, which is a lot more updated than our website, www.youtube.com forward slash C forward slash TGT Media. And the podcast is back after 12 years, which you can find at twogeekstalking.podbean.com. And you can find it on any other streaming service for your podcast that you get. So like and favorite and share it with your friends. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching on Two Geeks Talking.